So we can call this meeting to order. This is the Planning Commission, Richmond Planning Commission meeting of January 18th, 2023. Uh, welcome everyone. It looks like we have five of our planning commissioners here. So we do have a quorum and we have some guests and we have no guests. Do we have five? Yeah, we have five. one, two. One, two. Oh, We're still waiting for one more. Oh no, we do. No, wait. All right. Oh, well, not one yet. Sorry. sorry. We aren't open yet. We don't have a quorum. We only have four. We need five. Jumping in. Yay. Yeah. Well, you can also always go to the website and go to agenda and get in that way. But Okay, okay, I've got I've got you now. I'm on. Okay. Bye. Right. Thank you, Virginia. You're welcome. Welcome, Allison. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Good to hear you sound better. Thank you for coming, Allison. So well, we know it was it had been my intention, and I was floating all over my in email trying to find this thing. Okay, we'll we'll um, fix that for next time. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we now have a quorum. We have five members of the Richmond Planning Commission. We can start the recording um, and welcome everyone again to this meeting for January 18th, 2023. And we're going to start off with seeing if anyone wants to make any adjustments to the agenda. The principal portion of the agenda being Continued discussion of the gateway and village residential commercial districts and their associated amendments. And we're going to run through the attorney's comments and see if anyone else has any comments. And hopefully we can get to a point of finalizing the language. And um, we have also the bylaw amendment reports, which are required for us to create before we send it to the select board. We can review those. We have them and uh, talk about the next step in the approval process so we can get this moved along to the select board. So would anyone like to make any adjustments to that agenda? Okay, not seeing any hands, we will work from that agenda. Are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment about something not on the agenda? I'm assuming that our guests are here to talk about this agenda item. Okay, not seeing any hands. We have no studio audience, by the way. So um, we will proceed. Next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes of January 4th, 2023, our meeting. Compiled by Duncan. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, any comments, corrections, adjustments to the minutes? I think I submitted a few comments, didn't I? Yeah, there were a few, but okay. they're updated. Yeah, yeah. They're online. so I had submitted already a few comments and they were updated to reflect that. So does anyone else have any comments they would like to make? Hearing none. Seeing no hands, we'll consider those to be approved. They will be accepted into the record as written. Okay, so we'll go on to our next agenda item, which is our main order of business. And um, we're gonna go through the attorney's comments, which will also give us an opportunity to have any other comments made Lisa, thank you for your comments. And you oh. could make them at the time that we get to it in sure. the mm -hmm. proceeding okay. with the document. Um, and I just wanted to remind people that the attorney is only engaged to tell us whether what we're doing is legal or not. Uh, he can't tell us what we want here in Richmond or what is even practical or desirable. He is only engaged to tell us if it's legal. So. And he didn't have any major comments. There were no red flags for him. So, okay. 
So I think we're going to start right in with that and see if we can get through the documents, looking at it this way, looking at his comments saying, yes, we could add that in. Most of his comments were very minor language comments. Um, so Duncan is going to put that document up on the screen. It's, uh, I think the fourth one there, the regulation markup. Is that the one you want? Yeah. Or, yeah. No, yeah. not that one. Okay. See uh, the amendment? It's the one I just oh, yeah. sent you. Oh, the one. Okay. Yeah, Most that one. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. So this was the one that we sent to the attorney for review. Um, and he his comments were made on it and he sent it back to me and then we had a conversation on the phone as well. So um, we'll go to the first comment. Yeah, I think this is one oh, you sent me earlier. I that's think. Yeah, not so you one. want the one, I think this one here. Uh, let's see. We want the one with his comments on it. It should say SPF comments at the top. Um, That's markup thing. Uh, let's see. Let's get this guy out of the way. Markup. No, nope. pulled up that It's one. not that markup. It's we'll get nope. a up here. Let's not the bylaw right. amendments. The most recent one. That's the other thing. Did I get that most it's recent one? It's the most one. recent one. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Nope. nope, not that one. I mean, there's not letter C. Um, the, uh, what was there? the third one. This one? That one? I thought that was this Let's one. go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Wait, no, not go back up. No, that's the one that I sent him. That oh, is not okay. the one with okay. his comments okay. on it. That's the version that I sent him, and then he puts it Okay, let me just get this. It might take me a second here. Let's see. Yes, I might have got it. It should be the last one that you got an email on. I might be able yeah, to. Yeah, hold on. I'm, I'm pulling it up. Let's see. Loading it again. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Again, yes. A question: When we get the zoning amendments, yes, fully dealt with and passed, or a lot of them passed eventually. Yeah. Do these? Okay, um, we got it. Do these goals and actions go with those? Go down a little bit. We'll yes, see if we got it or not. <laughs> what? Right. Do the goals and actions that are described in here? Wait, 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 wait! Don't go so fast. Okay, yep, this is the version that we want. Okay, good. Oh, that's one twelve. Okay. So anyway, quick question, just the, yep. the goals and actions, for example, here on page two of the uh, bylaw amendment report. Um, for example, the, the town plan, actually the actions listed in the town plan, energy goal number one, uh, number one, uh, economic development goal number one. Do those go with the final, Amendment document. They're in the bylaw amendment report. Okay. 
which we send to the select board. Okay. So it should be on a page that's titled bylaw amendment report. Okay. That's the justification for what we're doing. Gotcha. Basically, okay. it's explaining to them really what we're doing. They're illuminating as far as right. Uh, yes, here's what our original purpose was. Yes. Sometimes it's hard to remember when that's the stop. justification right. for the changes that we're making. Good. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about these comments and any other comments that people have as we swing by these pages. So here we have the first um, it's in blue. You can see the attorney, David Rue, his comments are in blue, and he just um, rewrote things a little bit there. Um, his question to us was, if we actually want to say that large-scale commercial uses are inconsistent with the character of the district and should be prohibited, we can say that outright if we want. I was not sure that that was something that we necessarily wanted to say about the village, that we're prohibiting large scale commercial uses. And to me, large scale was unclear what that actually mm -hmm. meant. And there yeah. would be questions about how big it was. We already are planning to put by means of our definitions, that the only retail, grocery, and pharmacy uses are 5,000 square feet or less. So uh, other uses <clears throat> theoretically could be bigger. We're not limiting the size in that way for any other uses except for those three uses. So, okay. Um, okay. you know, we have some larger scale like uh, Harrington's is already a larger scale. That would be grandfathered, obviously. Um, I don't know that we want to prevent any larger scale. So that seemed to me to go a bit beyond what we wanted to do. He was fine with putting this kind of language, this character of the neighborhood language in. This is, as we all understand, not the regulatory portion of this document. This is a non-regular regulatory portion of the document, as Revy has told us over and over again. Um, but it does give, for instance, the DRB, when they're reviewing something, something to hang their hat on in terms of what the purpose, um, you know, in the conditional use review, they are allowed to look at the purpose of the district as well as the town plan. So they could look at the statement under the purpose section and say, well, this is what this district is going for. So, Chris. There we go. Um, so this doesn't, this isn't regulatory. This is just the purpose of the district. And when you talked about Harrington's and them being grandfathered, would that mean that they would be on a non-conforming lot after that? And if they were on a non-conforming lot, if they needed to expand, I don't even know if they have room to expand, but if they needed to expand on a non-conforming lot, could they do that? These are the questions that we wish we had ready for. Right. Um, Well, Just, they would, it wouldn't be a non-conforming lot. I mean, it would be a non-conforming use, right? If we yeah. had said you can't have a large commercial right. uh, operation, it would be a non-conforming use. My only um, concern, my only concern, would be they've been in town for a long, long time, and they're a good, solid business, and I, I wouldn't want to see us inadvertently um, harm them in any way in terms of future plans, but I have no idea uh, whether how much land they own and whether they could build out on that lot or whether they have any desire to. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sense is yeah. that if they have a if they have a compliant use and they want to expand it, they're they're not expanding the nonconformity. The nonconformity is the the arrangement. No, the nonconformity would be the use if we're it saying okay. you can't have a large commercial and we're defining that. I mean, whether we would define that as a large commercial use, it <clears> seems <throat> a little ambiguous to me. So, and whether, mm -hmm. you know, 
I'm not sure to me in the non-regulatory portion, you say something is prohibited. What does that mean? You know, we aren't saying that down under permitted uses or conditional uses mm -hmm. that you can't do that. So to me, it I was not inclined to put that in. I liked the other changes that he made, the uh, you know, the way he rearranged the language, but Jeff. Um, I, and I don't know the answer to that question. I had a different question um, and it was relative to the, uh, the potential new grocery store in the village. Is it, am I correct in assuming that um, uh, what you're dealing with right here is, is that, that, that the, the new grocery store, the potential new grocery store is in a different zone than what you're dealing with right exactly. here? Exactly. Okay. Yep, the new grocery store on Railroad Street will be in the Village Commercial District, not okay. this district. Okay. So anyone want to put that comment of the attorneys in, or are you fine with the way he rewrote it in the blue? Is everybody good with that? <clears throat> I'm going to assume if you don't raise your hand, you don't want to make any changes from what you see here, that you're accepting of his blue language, but not wanting to put the other thing in. Okay. Yeah, yeah I would go to what you just said. It's, we have this for informative purposes for ourselves if we need to go back and refresh our memories. This this discussion, this whole discussion on this zoning district seems to be quite convoluted. And I, it's I'm very not, convoluted. I'm not sure six months from now, I'm gonna remember exactly how it went there. So these uh, little, notes on the side and so forth help. Okay, so let's scroll up a bit. Um, so these are changes that we had put in and that we had sent to the attorney that he didn't make any comments about. He's fine in my discussion on the phone with him about having these definitions, grocery store, village scale, pharmacy, village scale, retail, village scale, which is 5,000 square feet or less. That he says is perfectly legal and you can do that. So what we're proposing here is that in the village residential commercial district, basically for those three uses, that's gonna be the size that we um, limit it to. And there's some other features to those districts that we, when we get to the definitions, we will talk about. He also says it's fine to make your rev regulations by way of definitions, which was a question that I had, but he said that's acceptable. So does anyone, is everybody okay with these limitations on these three types of uses to 5,000 square feet or less? Yes. Anybody else wanna make any other comments about these uses? Jeff, do you have a new comment or an old oh, comment? No, I don't have a new comment. Duncan, could you um, uh, increase the font on that? It's a little hard yep. to read. Better, thank you. Okay, so we're assuming that everybody is good with this suite of conditional uses here. All right, moving on. Just yell if you if I'm going too fast or something. Nothing with the dimensional requirements, that was fine. Okay, we come down to 3.3.5, the development standards. So. This is the other way that we're controlling chain businesses, if you like to look at it like that. One is by size. The other is by the requirements that we're putting on the outside of the buildings, because appearance is clearly a big thing about these buildings that people don't like. Some people don't like them. So um, <clears throat> under the site design standards, we, he has added this language saying that things have to be screened or blocked from public view as long as the buildings don't obscure them, which is reasonable, I think. So I was okay with that. In other words, if the thing that you need to be screened is in back of a building and you can't see it from the road anyway, then it doesn't have to be screened further, that the building is okay to screen green and completely block it from public road 
view. So that was point I, and the point II, I wondered if we wanted to say in this district that commercial parking and loading is actually just not allowed in the front yards. What we have in point I is saying that you have to screen commercial parking and loading. Now in our other district, the gateway, we have said that we just don't want parking in the front because it's a scenic approach to Richmond. Do we wanna say in this district, now you can't ban any parking from the front yards because many people's houses have parking in the front yard already. So it would not make sense to ban all parking from the front, but we could ban parking and loading from the front or we could just require it to be screened. Do people have any feeling about that? If someone can screen it, so it's not that obvious, I guess you know it could be anywhere they would want it. Uh, personally, I think that I'm trying to think of truck traffic, and I would think they'd want to do that out back just because of the noise and the non. It doesn't look inviting when you see it from the street, so it's not going to. I don't have a strong feeling about it unless I could see an example, and uh, right. It's too late once we have that. Uh, the other thing he suggests is that if you're going to, you have to say that it completely blocks it from view. You can't just say screening it. So that's fine. We can add in the word completely screen or completely block from view. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Um, well, the example that I would use would be Cumberland Farms. Uh, you know, they, they, they have nothing and, uh, you know, no landscaping or whatever in front. Um, and it's a, it, the loading is really a problematic, you know. And, they're, they're, they have their trucks halfway out and into Route 2. Um, so you wouldn't want that. Um, it, it, this seems this language seems to solve that, it would appear. To, to, yeah, I mean, Cumberland Farms is neither screened and completely blocked from view or not allowed. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. neither one of those are fulfilled. So I if we... It's compliant to these district standards, but it doesn't have to be. No, it's so, grandfathered the way it is, mm -hmm. but thinking of any new things, banning parking in the front is a way of, you know, discouraging certain kinds of businesses. But I don't know that, you know, it's pretty common to park in the front here. Yeah, Arabesque, you know, they park in front. At, at, um, uh, at Harrington's, they park in front. Well, Arabesque, they park on the side, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it depends on how you define front and side, I guess, sort of. The front is the between the facade that faces the public road okay. and the road. Okay. So arabesque would count as parking on the side. Okay. Harrington's really parks in front. <laughs> you know, yep. they park right along the road. So as, as does Cumberland Farms. Yeah. Well, as does Cumberland Farms, yeah. exactly. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts about as, at, as does the the ski shop? Yeah. yeah. As does the business across the way. So as does it does, make sense to prevent it if many businesses no, in Richmond do it? I I don't think it makes any sense to 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 prevent it because this is not a commercial district. This is a mixed use district, and that means there's there's mixed uses and. And people, you know, want to park and may want to park in front of their house, you know, if they have a little turnaround spot. But I'm not, I don't, I don't want to control everything. You know, if it, yeah. if it becomes a problem later, then deal with it later. But it doesn't seem to be a problem right now. And there's not a lot of space to build parking lots in front of structures, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Harrington's only has room for like four or five vehicles at a time. It's not overly big. It's just to allow people to go in and out. And what this is intended to do is that you don't pave over the whole front yard and turn it into a parking lot. You know, uh, Papa, Papa McGee's is that. Mm. Yep. 
Yeah, it sure doesn't look good when you pave the whole front yard. It really doesn't. Well, maybe that's what should be prohibited. <laughs> yeah. And it I mean, it says, well, I guess that was front yard shall be vegetated. Street yeah. trees are encouraged. So it encouraged to be incorporated as a front yard vegetation. So yeah, was was this an existing? Well, I don't, I, let's not get into how the pizza place got their paved front yard. But <laughs> um, if the use were to change, then, you know, would that front yard have to go back to being vegetated yeah i think it would Good. okay so i'm hearing i think that everybody's okay with the way it is written that we're just requiring the front yard to be vegetated um it it sort of conflicts a tiny bit with the first one that says that parking and loading shall be screened um, but maybe not. I mean, if you vegetate the front yard and you park on the side, then you have to screen the parking that's on the side. I suppose both of those things could work together adequately. Yeah, and everybody, I mean, it's, this isn't going to impact any existing landowner. It's not going to impact Cumberland because they can't meet these requirements. No, it's not going to, it's not going to affect any existing businesses right. that they, the way they are with the use they are, so. All right, so we're good with leaving that the way it is with just his rearrangement of the words. It's a little awkwardly structured, but yeah, the idea of it. So. Maybe it could be worded a little bit more smoothly. Okay, so going on to building design standards, he questioned whether we shouldn't define what significantly remodeled is and I researched this a little bit and 50%. There was one reference that I saw to 65%. I couldn't find anything in our zoning that um, oh. the DRB defined significant remodeling as. So this I, seemed to be okay. <laughs> I think you're safer with a the number there because everybody can measure meaning 50% or more, more okay. than half. Yeah, that's the def that's the definition the state uses. More anything more right. than fifty percent, that's significant. Right. Didn't you use that on the uh, um, on the fueling stations? You know the requirement that uh, at significant renovations uh, uh, for a vehicle fueling station needs to have a level three charger. I don't know that it was defined ever. Oh, no, I, I, I think it was, they wanted to, they wanted to do a complete replacement, which was a significant change. So that gave us the opportunity to, and we were doing the right, I don't think they're linked, Jeff. Well, that was for the mobile station, but you did it for all um, uh, uh, vehicle fueling stations. So any vehicle fueling stations, if, if, if um, uh, you know, that was where one of my concerns was is. If, if the lucky spot wanted to do a renovation, um, it would have required them putting in a level three charger. <clears throat> and I thought it, I thought it was significant renovation at 50%. I know the floodplain regulations are that. You know, so I think oh, the, they have, yeah, they don't call it significant remodeling. They call it an impact. Let's see. Let's see what the vehicle sure. fueling station says. I mean, you just want to I make it consistent. I would about think. it being significant, but I'm not sure we ever defined what that meant. I seem to recall 50, percent but maybe I'm maybe I'm making it up. Uh, page 37. I'll tell you what it says. Um. No, it doesn't say anything about it, about so, remodeling at all under vehicle fueling stations. So would this be more, uh, it, would it be more appropriate as a definition or does it need to be in every, uh, you know, every zone or every category? 
I think it is in, in for, um, uh, you know, I've been looking into it for the town center building um, and the, uh, there's more stringent floodplain regulations that kick in uh, with substantial renovations or, or uh, and I think it was 50% of the value. It was 50% of the value of the building. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, FEMA does it by the value mm -hmm. of the building, which seemed more difficult than this, you know, for us to just go out and assess, but... Mm -hmm. um, so, and you may be right, Jeff, but so far what we've been doing is we've been only wanting to talk about individual districts. So we're gonna put it in each individual district. And then when we finish all the districts and come to make a better whole of the zoning, then we can determine if we wanna put it as a definition. Okay, uh, you know, I, I would just encourage you to be as consistent as possible between yeah. sections. So what we will do here is we will put it in this one and we will put it in the other one in the other. That's the two that we're working on. And um, it's one of those things that's on the list to keep in mind to make the whole document compatible is that we have to have certain things that are the same throughout. Yeah, you, right. you okay. And you think area is easier. So I mean, I'm just trying to imagine a, a remodel. So, you know, the, so <laughs> if, if the lucky spot wanted to avoid something, you know, either in this section or another section, they wanted to avoid something. They didn't, if they, they left the facade the way it was and they made a brand new space inside, they would avoid this. Is that right? Yeah. But I don't think we care what it looks like inside. Right? I mean, we only care what it looks like on the outside. I see what you're okay. saying. We'd like it to look better, <laughs> but it's, that's a want more than a need. Well, it, well, it, it, well it's also, it, it, uh, it affects the level three charger. That's, that's why I was saying it is, is so, you know, so if you wanted to avoid the $150,000 cost of putting in a level three charger, they could leave it look, look the way it is and, and remodel the inside. Is that right? Well, their permit has them putting in a charger. I'm talking about the the uh, lucky spot. Oh, okay. Or similar that we come come on farms, I guess. You know, I it, it you know it seems to me the the the, the value is it's an easier one. So like you you have the you know at least the assessed value of the building. Any build, every building in town, we have an assessed value. And if it goes over that, then that's over 50%, it seems easier to determine than taking a tape measure out and saying, you know, what's the, is it the square footage area or is it the surface area? It's the area, but I mean, the point of these standards were about the appearance of the buildings. They weren't about leveraging anything from it. They were about the way the building looks. So that's what all of these standards relate to is the appearance because we are invested in the way these buildings look. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, 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 my point only is that if you want these, uh, these standards to apply to any individual building, then you need to determine that 50%. And the 50%, you know, I think you do need to make a distinction between surface area or square footage area or, you know, value. They're, they're, those are all different things. Yeah. Well, I don't think we want to go to value if it, if you're talking about any, you know, I think with FEMA, the reason that they go to value is because the whole building inside and outside is going to have to be replaced and is going to have to be assessed. This, this is about the way the building looks. So I can understand the concern if you want the square footage or, but we're talking about the facade. So it's a flat surface. So we assume that you're talking about 
the square footage of the flat surface. So you, it's, you, you, what you're talking about uh, the uh, so like if you wanted to put new clapboards on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or change the windows, or rearrange the doors, or well, well, cha changing the windows and doors would not less not, it would likely not be fifty percent. So, in, which might be fine. I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. That's all. I'll, I'll shut up. Commercial industrial zone where Lucky Smart is. Yeah. Commercial. Or it might be the commercial. Yeah. Or commercial industrial. One or the other, which yeah. we're trying to make together anyway. I mean, this standard doesn't necessarily go to that zone. We're talking village. Right. right now. This so, one right now is in the village. Right. So, we, Jeff, we have an opportunity to rethink these standards for a different zone when that zone comes up. So not that we don't want this in every zone, but you know, we can make that decision when we get there. Okay. Chris. So uh, this is, um, I, I do like values. I, I don't know the definition of this. The uh, state statutes and regulations are on values. So if you remodel a commercial building, and your remodeling is over 50%, you know, the project cost to remodel the building is more than 50% of the assessed value of the building, then that is a significant remodeling. If it's less than 50%, it isn't. And why it's important is because certain codes, to meet certain codes, once you go over 50%, you then fall under that code requirement. And you know, this says building design standards, these standards shall apply to all new construction and, and significantly remodeled exteriors of existing structures. So it's only this definition is saying that it's for a remodeled, it's only the exterior of the existing structure. And I guess that points to your um, comment about it just being about aesthetics, meaning that more than 50% of, of the area of the structure's facade and building walls are those interior building walls or exterior building walls? I'm assuming they're exterior since this is just about aesthetics. But it's not well, clear. Do we want to work more on this definition? Shall I put a star by that as to work on it a little bit more? It says yeah, I'm, I'm sort of rethinking what I was saying you know, about the state's position and the state codes because um those are st strictly commercial and these could be um residential buildings too right well with the exception of single family or two family is what it says so we okay. omitted them from this standard okay so it would be multifamily or which commercial. have all the requirements or commercial um, but not a home occupation not a home occupation if it's a home, if it's a single family or two, two family home. Right. Okay. I'll just need to think about it some more. Thank you. Okay. So shall we put a little star by that one and do a little more work on that one? Yeah, maybe more group think, you know, just to or next time, you know, we'll we'll check out some other sources of definitions for this. Um but I do think that we ought to stick with the way it looks because that was the whole point of these standards. But Okay, moving on. So there were a few other little comments there at the top. I don't know, they all seem reasonable to me. They were just wording comments. Okay, so then we come down to the additional multifamily housing standards. Uh, oh, no, we got that. Multiple structures on a lot. So the attorney was fine with this. He says it works fine. Um, many towns do it. They have multiple principal structures on a lot. He did later, after we talked, come back with another comment, which um, Duncan is going to put up on the screen. <laughs> which was um, seemed reasonable to me. He thought it was fine the way it was and it was probably fine the way it was, but his additional comment, he felt made it a little more clear. Yep, that's the one. So perfect, thank wow. you. 
So this is what he suggested adding in to this language is, and we thought we had this covered in point three, but he thought it was better if we also put in point one in a situation of where so-called footprint lots, in other words, let's say you have a duplex and you wanna sell half of it with only the land that it stands on, you know, like a condo thing, or where lots smaller than the required minimum size are proposed as part of the proposed plan of ownership, then the DRB requires that the applicant record this thing called a notice of conditions in the land records, which states that for planning and zoning purposes, the larger lot is to be considered the single lot. So for instance, if you're talking about the coverage on this lot, you're talking about the whole lot and all the buildings on it. You're not, you can't talk about the coverage of this footprint lot separately from the larger lot. So as that is how he explained it to me, um, our resident lawyer, Dan is not here, who's on the board to talk about it, but this was the language that he recommends that we put in there. So I'm, I'm wrestling with the lots smaller than the required minimum size are proposed. I mean, how does that even make it off the paper of smaller than the required minimum size? Well, it makes it off the paper because let's say you have a duplex okay. and you want to sell part of it. Part of it. Okay. The lot on which it stands Let's is see. smaller than the minimum size. Okay, okay. that's so was, the minimum size is, you know, or for instance, the 5,000 square feet dwelling okay. unit per 5,000 square feet. If you have a little half of a duplex that's only 3,000 square feet, gotcha. you so, can sell it if you have that in your proposed ownership plan. So unless this involves a building that's already built, it really is nothing happen, I guess. This, this is a sale after the initial construction. Right. Okay. Which you have to have mm -hmm. per point number two, you have to propose those arrangements mm -hmm. for ownership. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, as Joy pointed out last time in PUDs, you have some of these situations or in condos, you have some of the situations. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm good with this. That seems like a reasonable thing to put in there. Anybody else want to talk about that or think about it or? Okay. So that looks good. Let's move on to the gateway. Okay, and then he just had that slight change in the wording, but he felt that this I, statement of the features was fine. Oh, wait, you had a comment about the gateway. Yeah. Do you Lisa have had a comment. It was in my other computer, which doesn't talk to this oh. one. So. Um, okay, so basically Lisa suggested that we put in the purpose and I'm thinking it would be better in the features that um, it's important to the town that the iconic view or the view of the iconic camel's hump be retained and not be um, in this district think, and not be obstructed. Mm -hmm. Do people like that? Do you want to add that in? That seemed like a reasonable thing. I mean, well, I'm hoping it's specific enough that it can fly, you know, legally. Um, no one else has camels hump. You really can't see camels hump from any other angle anywhere else in the town like that. So it is unique and it is worth protecting. Right. And mostly you see camel sump before you actually get to the gateway. Right. So hopefully. So there's really not very much that's going to get in the way of it, but. Well, there's it a couple seems... of parcels on the right hand side of route two as you're coming into town. So there's a couple of buildable spots. There. On the right hand side is not in this district. Oh, oh, okay. Is that still ag res or ag? It's ag res. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Right. Let's remember that when we get there. Uh, Would so you mind repeating that? I, I missed it. What was Lisa's suggestion? Um, just Joy, that the um, to be sp as specific as possible for this mm -hmm. gateway zone, view of Camel's Hump not be obstructed 
by any developments. Uh, that's under, basically what letter I was trying to say there. Oh, no, uh, I had added on to letter I. Well, you added into the up into the purpose, but it seemed like it was yeah. the kind of thing that you would make into a feature. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't, you know, since it's non-regulatory language, like some of these other things, like number I, mm -hmm. it didn't seem like it was any more problematic than that. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's one of, it's a very specific thing that we can state about the quality of the appearance. Um, Except um, that the the side that Campbell's hump is on is not part of the gateway. Right. Yeah, I realize that. There's not much that could occur in the gateway side that would obstruct it. Um, what, what about where uh, Verber's barn used to be? It's is not, not a in part the of the gateway. No. no I wish gateway. it were. <laughs> it should be. But. The only place... So my, in my experience that you can really see Camel's Hump well is like coming off the highway at exit 11 from the north. You can see it right around exit 11, you know, on yeah. the highway just before you get off and coming off. But when you actually get into the gateway, it doesn't seem like you can really see Camel's Hump anymore. Yeah, except on the south side of uh, Route 2. Well, on the south side of Route 2, which is not in the gateway. So, so I, I, I got to think about that one because it's not a part of the gateway. But it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't appear to be an issue of any development obstructing Camel's Hump in the gateway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I, so, I, I, I'll process that. That's new. I have to think about that. <laughs> and again, I am an owner of Pete's property in the gateway. I will not be voting on this, but I do give my input at these meetings as to suggestions of what, um, as an owner in the gateway, we suggest. So just to make sure that's clear. Okay. So for right now, we'll leave it just the way it is, and we'll think about Lisa's suggestion. That's two things to think about for next time. Okay, so moving along. Permitted uses, I think you're good with that. There were no comments there. Conditional uses. Actually, um, Virginia, I did have a comment about that. What happened to storage? What? What happened to storage? Not permitted uses, I'm sorry. Conditional use um, uses. Didn't we have that in at one point? I don't know when it got taken out. In permitted uses? N no, in conditional. Okay. So in conditional uses, you're asking about what? I didn't still didn't catch it. That's all right. Storage? Stor like self-storage or? Yeah, any kind of storage. Yeah, I think Outside of uh, a primary building or use? Inside outside a primary storage? building, outside. I mean, if it's if it's shielded, I'm just. I don't remember it being taken out. I remember we had it in at one point. I think warehouse takes into consideration any kind of storage inside. Okay. Can we clarify that? Well, we'd have to look at the uh, specifics of the uses. I, we may have gone through this exercise before, but I, I saw in the parking requirements storage. So that reminded me of the use storage. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah, so warehouse use is defined at the moment as a building used primarily for the storage of goods and materials, which may also be made available to the general public for a fee. <laughs> I guess I right. mean the storage is available for a fee, not the good, the goods and materials, I think is what yeah. they mean. So All that right. takes care of the inside storage, right? right? Adequately for you? Yes. Yeah. And would a business yard be, I mean, again, just so everybody knows, everything is screened entirely in this in this uh, zone. Yes. So yep. but is a business yard considered outdoor storage? Like if somebody a wanted to do yard. Like, Boats or cars or whatever. 
Business yard, definition, a business which operates out of a yard, which may include structures, indoor and outdoor storage of materials, equipment, or vehicles. So a business yard is allowed. Would you guys say that that's outdoor storage as well? I mean, is that definition? Joy, what would you call a business yard? Would that be a lump or a? I mean, I think of a business yard like our um, business yard at um, our shop, or like Dan's um, outdoor storage. I mean, it, it is basically storage, you know. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Want to? I I just felt like it was in and then I felt like somehow it disappeared. But are you basically saying that these two things cover that? Well, a business yard, it also says a majority of the business activity shall take place off site. So, I mean, my feeling of a business yard is more like where there's equipment or vehicles mm -hmm. or something, you know, loaders and what have you oh, some extra on as a business yard um, right. so outdoor storage associated i mean you could have outdoor storage really associated with warehouse things, things yeah even like uh well things. how do you guys feel about people being able to store having a place to park a car or a boat or whatever it is, if it's shielded by what we talk about it, um, throughout the, the zone, I mean, how, how does that feel to everybody? Uh, um, would that be something you would want to allow? Yeah, if it's shielded, I don't think there's an issue. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think where Yeah. In the commercial district, they have outdoor storage as an accessory use to any permitted or conditional use listed as a use. But that's kind of the only. Well, in the industrial commercial district, they also talk about conditional use of outdoor storage as an accessory use to any conditional or permitted use. The other districts don't really talk about that. But uh, under the development standards, there's a variety of screening, degrees of screening or... Um, Completely blocking I, from view yeah. or whatever. So. Because so, we have that in there, it assumes that you can have outdoor storage, I think. Can I say something for you guys to think about as you move forward through the gateway? So sure. I'm sure some of you have read the front porch forum posts um, and, you know, the future of sewer, in my mind, is really kind of, I don't know, maybe bleak um, at this point, which is really sad for me. Um, so when you go through and you think about these uses, think about sewer never going down there. Mm. And if that's the case, you know, the housing, all of that, that we've talked about this whole time might not ever happen. And storage would be a great use for people down there who can't do much else. So I'm just putting that out there. Well, you know, that's a, yeah, that's a dismal point, but good, well made. Good point. Yeah. So, and it would just be the outdoor storage part that would be possibly not covered because warehouse use seems to cover indoor storage. Mm -hmm. What what so, is what is the status of the sewer and water line? Yeah, you, you tell me. I have no idea. It doesn't. I try and get answers, and it's not. I've, I, I've read yeah, somewhere. it's not a good topic with me right now. But that's the way I look at it. Like this might not ever happen. So, um, it, is it still a? 
I've, I've tried to follow along in the front porch forum, but I can't make heads or tails of it. Is it still a, um, a town project or is it a, a no, private project? No, it's no a we've, private... Been told, we've been told to go do it on our own. Okay. And then we've been told that if we do it on our own, it's not going to go much further than us. So why wouldn't it um, go to the mobile station? Why because the land we... trust doesn't want it to go there. But then all of that overflow uh, mm -hmm. doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You're going to have a septic system, or I guess they'll either have to pump it or they'll have to do that horizontal thing and build a septic system somewhere in town, right. which, which is not good for the environment. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the update. No problem. Um, so, Joy, can I ask you if you've taken your <laughs> easement across the land trust land? Are you that would be you would put your line there, or are you not thinking of doing that? I, you know, honestly, Virginia, my head is just so. Um, this it's just been a lot the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe we'll stick with the outdoor storage question. Yeah, I, I just honestly, like, I'm so discouraged by everything. It's, it's, um, yeah, bring on the storage. <laughs> like, I just don't know what's going to happen down there. But if it's, if it's up to right now, the way it stands, it's not going to go very far, you know, so. All right. Sorry, you guys, I didn't mean to like it to, into all of that, but I do, I think that you do have to consider the fact that that might happen. So, yes. No, all right. You're right. That does wag the whole dog. So, on the gateway. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the most we can deal with at the moment is the outdoor storage question here whether or not to put that in to give their yeah. some more options that are well, not so water and sewer dependent right where do we say outdoor storage per se i mean unsupported by any other use well in the industrial commercial and the commercial districts but there's there's still they say outdoor storage as an accessory use right. to some it's, other right. use so there's a there's a beginning and then there's outdoor storage that follows it around so, so Outdoor storage as a use, I mean, what are we picturing? Boats? It could be anything. It could be a pile of, you know, headless dolls. Well, I mean, <laughs> but is are you picturing it as a use associated with something else? No, it should be some sort. It shouldn't have a business activity associated with it. Therefore, that business is the... Owner Therefore, that, it's an accessory storage. use. Exactly. That's what I, they're I talking about be... in the other in the IC and the C districts. Right. They're talking about it as an accessory use to some other business. Right. Storage, you know, as itself is a dump. I mean, I think by definition, it's stuff that's dumped. If it doesn't have any value and it has no business activity associated with it to bring it in and out, delivery, whatever, it's stuff that just sits in a place. It, that's a dump, I think. Which I don't think we necessarily. No, I don't think we want that anywhere. No. I mean, something like Dan Noy's outdoor storage at the hardware store is an accessory use to his business, to his indoor business. Yeah. Then there's the lumber yard, which right. assumes there will be outdoor storage of lumber. Exactly. Or a business that sells cars or boats, which assumes there will be right. storage outdoors. Right. And in all those cases, in the boats. stuff comes in, stuff goes out. It, it moves. It may be slow, but it, it moves. It's not the same stuff from year to year. Um, if it were, uh, it, I guess I'd have to claim that's a dump. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dumping ground. Okay. Old boats, you know, used cars. So. All right. Well, I'll put that on my list. Of things that we're thinking about. Yeah, it's. That it brings up a good point, though. That's maybe something that we need to be careful about. Is we don't create a place that we collect. It's a collection. Mm -hmm. No purpose. All right. So let's move on. Scroll down here. Let's get a little further on here. Um. So, the lawyer suggested that under the site design standards. We should put in some language that says 
if there are pre-existing lots already, they can have curb cuts if they don't already have them, if the lots are pre-existing. So um, that seems reasonable. We don't want to have it be a taking, which is not allowing people to have a lot yeah. Yeah, we'll without that. allowing them to have access. So anybody have any problem with putting that in? No. Seems all right. Okay. Moving on. Um, and so some of this language, let's see. In this district, the gateway we have, uh, you can't park between the facade that faces Route 2 and Route 2. So actually there is no parking in the front yard. And then you have to screen those same things that we screened in the village district. Um, going down to multiple structures on a lot, we would add the same language in there about the notice of conditions for the same reason. Any more questions about that? Okay, moving on to multiple uses and principal structures on a lot. So this is the section that just allows you to make those other rules about, yeah, this is the page right here. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. There we go. This allows you to make, <clears throat> go, yeah, that's fine. That's great. Um, it allows us to make those special rules for the village RC and the gateway RC about allowing for multiple lots. We have had to change this language that prevented us from making that change. Right. And so what we have to do is in each one of the other zoning districts, this is one that we have to work across all the districts in order to make the whole thing compatible because mm -hmm. we're proposing a change for the whole ordinance section. Yeah, which covers the whole thing. Yeah. 4.5. And so each one of the other districts, we have to fix the language a little bit that allows us to make special provisions for those districts if we want. So if um, in, in, you know, we come to the HDR district and we want to allow more than one principal structure on a lot, we can put that in that language in that district because we have this background language that we've changed that allows us to do that. So, and the attorney thought that was fine. Those all say almost verbatim the same thing, correct? Yeah, yeah. well, they I mean, do. It's, They're it's, a little bit different for the commercial type districts versus the residential districts, the way it's, mm -hmm. and the reason we originally changed it was because of the one use on a lot. Because in the two, our two residential commercial, we have allowed multiple use buildings. So in order to have a multiple use building, you have to allow more than one use on a lot. So we have had to change this underlying phrase. And so as we go through the different districts, we may or may not make a change that is the otherwise provided elsewhere. But we're given the opportunity because we've got the basic structure there that allows us to do that. Did that answer your question? Because you had a yeah, question about that. It's a good list, actually. There's yeah. keep going back to it. And you go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's and good. in the markup of the whole document, these things do not occur altogether. They occur as they occur right, in each district. Wherever they pop up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any more issues about that? You know, our original structure had been only about uses. And now we have also said, principal buildings, we may have more than one. So, hmm. okay, but we can go on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, site plan review, we just added a few things there. The lawyer didn't have anything to say about that. The, uh, 
parking table. We haven't had many comments about um, 25 is too much, so it has to be 24. I don't know why. You know, Revy did this table. And two 12 foot lanes or something. He, vehicle clearance. It's, it's probably. He probably looked scary. into it. I can't say that I know exactly why right. that I is. Mean, I don't so see where a foot is really. Over. We're sort of trusting him on this one. Mm -hmm. And his numbers, we're trusting his numbers. Right. We did have this question about, you know, we've changed to retail large scale and retail small scale. You can go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we find that the term retail business occurs throughout the document, only sometimes it's retail business and sometimes it says business comma retail, which we're assuming those are equivalent. But so we've had to leave that in retail business. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's with restaurant fast food, but it's really a separate line. Right. So for the moment, we have to, in the districts that talk about a retail business, that is what will have to be examined until we go to those districts and fix them and use our term retail large scale and retail village scale. Right. But for the moment, we can't get rid of that retail business. It mm -hmm. does not apply to these two districts. Mm -hmm. In these two districts, our large scale and vill village scale retail language applies. Right. It supersedes the previous, in other words, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. eventually we will hope to fix that by not having that there, but mm -hmm. that is gonna take Looking at all the other districts. Allison's got her hand up. Allison. Yes. Oh, thank you, Virginia, or Chris, or somebody. I uh, I was going back to the um, not having more than one use on a lot. Um, what if somebody wanted to live in a place and have a business within the same building or at the same lot? Is that not going to be permitted? Well, you would have to do that as a PUD. Uh-huh. So far, what we have said is you could only have two principal structures if they were both hosting residential uses. Mm-hmm. You can have a multiple use building. Oh, what was your question again? Can you live in a building and have a business in the building? Right. Okay. Or could you could you have a house and a business building on the same lot? That you would have to do as a PUD. Yeah. That we have not put into these regulations. We considered it, yeah. whether we wanted to say you could have two principal buildings on a lot of any use. Yeah. And we arrived at just saying you could have two principal uses that were residential but you could have a pud and under pud you can do lots of things mm -hmm. so it's just a little more that. trouble yeah. what that's a graceful way out of that for the future because we don't really know if that will even ever be applied for us um the pud 53 so would an example of that be like a michael lamaris um uh, upholstery Shop is a separate, he's got, you know, a garage that's a business and he lives in the house. I believe that that is a home occupation okay. or it might be a cottage okay. industry. The garage is considered to be an accessory structure of the house. It's not another principal structure. I see. Okay. So, yeah, we have these two categories. We have the home occupation and then we have cottage industry, which is a bigger home occupation. Um which requires conditional use. Home occupation is a permitted use. And it can be in an accessory structure. Okay, but that's so, not what that statement looked like back up. It's back up a page or two. It just didn't look like that. Um, yeah, okay. Where is that? Keep going back, 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 back. Yep, to the top of this column of things here. Yep, right there. Multiple uses and principal structures on a lot. 
only one use on a lot and only one principal structure on a lot. Unless, Unless otherwise you, provided elsewhere in these regulations. So okay. in these two districts, we have provided otherwise by saying that you can put two principal structures on a lot and that you can have a multi-use building. Okay. And, okay, because that looks a, a little... Um, <laughs> well, I guess that covers it. It's just that it, it looked a little bit uh, stringent on <laughs> at the beginning of the whole section. Okay. Well, yeah, it's... Let me see if I have it straight. But I think it's it's permissive zoning where we say what's permitted and and, and by by default everything else is prohibited unless it's you know been provided for specifically, or restrictive zoning where we say what's not allowed mm -hmm. and everything else is allowed. So, uh, well, uh, what is the well, purpose of that? What what is the purpose of of that statement there? What why why is that an important thing that only one use on a lot. Why is that important? Well, because that's what was is in the current zoning. That is what is in the current zoning. Uh -huh. There shall be only one use on a lot and only one principal structure on a lot. That is what is in the current zoning. Yeah, okay. And we had decided early on to work district by district. Yeah. So... We didn't necessarily want to change this without discussion in all the other districts in case people wanted oh. to discuss it. That's why we didn't. That's a good point. That's why we did it this way. It's so that so still that holds for the that still holds for the zoning document in general. But in these two districts, we have provided otherwise. And, and you, when we look at the AR district, we will decide, do we want that to be true or do we want to also provide otherwise? It's an awkwardness based on this system of you know, doing one district at a time. You may recall, Allison, that we had a, a meeting and uh, Mark was very concerned about the process, mm -hmm. not so much about the uses, but, you know, the process and so we agreed to put okay. this language in until we finish the whole thing. And then as we're going through districts, we can determine what the exceptions are, if we're going to create exceptions for them. But, you know, in your fundamental question, Allison, I, I don't disagree with you. I would like to understand better why we would prohibit more than one use on a lot. Okay, thank you. But I think we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's from the old the old language, you know, it's yeah. from yeah. part of the old yeah. leftover decision. Hmm. But in the PUD section, Allison, it does say 5.12.2, mm -hmm. PUD may include any permitted or conditional uses in the district in which it's located, multiple principal structures and or uses on a lot or multiple ownership of a single structure may be permitted. Okay. So if you, the PUD is another way of avoiding that statement that was in the zoning forever, that there's only one use or one principal use. Mm -hmm. You can do it by a PUD. The problem, mm -hmm. slight problem with the PUD is it takes longer and it's a more laborious and cumbersome process. Red tape. <laughs> more red tape. Yeah. Okay, I I guess I see how this um, evolved, uh, yeah. But I I guess I would. Uh, okay, so it's otherwise provided. All right, uh, I'll just get off that. So obviously, there's some other problems with it, but I just want to mention that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of a historical accident, I guess, and this is how we're getting around it. Okay, so the parking table, anybody have any problems with that? I'm sure those are numbers that are... Revy got accepted. the numbers and we're going to have to make it his legacy. So, no, I've got, um, Virginia, I've got one more comment about that. 
Is that yeah. the kind of thing? Is that the kind of thing that when people who are voting on these regulations might look at and think it like I did? Boy, this is pretty restrictive. I don't think I like that. When actually, uh, it's less restrictive, and there's a different kind of reason for doing it, but it looks very convoluted. It's it's just a question if we want people to support these documents, we we need to have things that are not um, confusing. Well, the first point is that we hope that people will not be voting on these documents, that the select board, when mm -hmm. faced with minimal opposition to any of this material, the select board will adopt it. This is our goal, is okay. to hopefully explain it to the people who are interested, who have come to some of these hearings, mm -hmm. all of our hearings, and have asked good questions, and we have explained it, that we don't have to explain it to all of the voters because that is difficult. So, and you know, that's kind of our rationale for doing them one district at a time is it's hard enough to understand one district. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so, this dialogue uh, is captured and available in the future to go along with. Yeah, the, the dialogue will be here. We can point mm -hmm. people to it. Um, you know, that's that's our goal is to have it not be too controversial by the time it comes to the select board. So if we have to explain it to everyone, then we'll have to develop some additional outreach material. Okay. Okay. So moving on, multifamily housing development standards. Oh, Jeff. So I don't want to beat this horse to death, but um which horse? The 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 uh, uh, only one principal structure that that okay sentence. yep the multiple structures horse okay yeah that that horse so the, we couldn't we can't strike that that sentence you're saying from this draft is that right? Well, right. we haven't had a discussion about that in all the other districts. And, uh, so each time, each place, so it would be it, so it would be inconsistent if we did it here. It would be inconsistent with the other districts. Is that correct? I'm, I'm just trying to understand the rationale. So um, you know, because you you are adding and subtracting language in various different parts of of this document as we're going through, but we you cannot modify that that uh, that sentence because it's in other sections of the document? We could take that sentence out entirely, which would alter the way this zoning document has been used in all those other districts that we haven't had this conversation about. That is why we don't want to take that out. Mm. At the very end of all it, that discussion, we could. Well, if we go to the AR, and the people who are interested in that district, mm -hmm. who have property in that district, or the HDR, people who have property in that district, let's say, let's take the HDR, they're more likely to worry about this. So we take that out entirely, mm -hmm. then the people in HDR, their district has been changed in a somewhat fundamental way without them being involved in the discussion. Because this 4.5 uh, applies to not just these two districts, but to all the districts? Yes. 4.5 has been forever in this zoning document. There shall be one use and one principal structure unless you do a PUD. That has been in this document. So the feeling okay. was that those people in all the other districts have not had the opportunity to think about this and decide if they want it. I mean, there was controversy about whether we wanted to allow more than one structure on a lot among the planning commissioners. So there may be controversy in the other districts about whether to do this or not. Okay, I think it, you know, I think it's a really good issue to highlight. I'm glad you brought it up, Allison. And, and you may have noticed that there was an article in the paper today that the 
uh, the legislature might pick up something that's related um, uh, of not allowing single family zoning, which th this sounds like that to me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, a, actually yeah. a, several bills in the legislature. The Bongarts Amendment is one, which I don't know if it's the one you're referring to, Jeff which has a lot of these things in here, you know, that we have put into these two districts that probably need to go town wide, but we haven't okay. had the discussion. I so, got you. Okay. I, so yeah. I understand. One that no, you I, can't, uh, can't disallow four family, you know, units, four unit dwellings that you can't disallow them. You know, mm -hmm. those kinds of things, if they become state legislature are going to affect the rest of our document but not these sections because we've already put those in place. I got you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. No problem. But yeah. Maybe in parentheses, just to add kind of guidance for the reader that this statement or this 4.5 applies to all of the sunny districts in the town, which are not all presented you know, right here, but they're elsewhere in this document. And can we can we do that instead of just leaving it as it is without any real clarification as to why it's there? Or is well, it just in the markup of the whole document, those will all occur in their right place. Okay, and okay, so that's when the public sees it. When and it's section ready. four point five will be where it has always been. Mm -hmm. Section four point five. Mm -hmm. which states that you can only have one use and one principal structure. Unless provided elsewhere. No, every, well, well, that's what we there. added. Yeah. Unless provided elsewhere mm -hmm. otherwise. So that has been added. And you will see then as you go through each of the other districts mm -hmm. that we have allowed for it to be changed if we want to change it by the time we get to those districts. Okay. okay. So it's not... Okay, so tell me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like there should be a public confusion about it when we get to that point because that, that progress will have been made. Or will it? <laughs> well, maybe the, maybe the legislature will, you know, solve the issue for us. <laughs> wow. The public process is going to go to the select board. <clears throat> so the people that we want to understand it, Jeff, <laughs> are the people on the select board, first of all. Yeah. yeah and you know, hopefully we can help them to understand it. And maybe I'll try to write up in my memo to the select board, which when we approve this document, I will write a memo to the select board explaining the changes that have been made. So I can put it in there and they can look at the original document marked up if right. they want to do that. So. Okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's the hope. Any more on this horse? Okay. We yeah. kind of understood that there would be difficulties with doing it district by district, but it seemed less difficult than trying to explain a whole entire document oh, yeah, to absolutely. people, it's, it's which is mind boggling. So, okay. So, parking. Then we did we do the stand the multiple use standards. There you go. Okay. We yeah, and we did. You'll notice in the parking table we introduced our terms of large scale and village scale that we're going to talk about in a minute because we'll we're almost getting there. Keep going. That's all part of the parking. Yeah, multifamily housing standards. There weren't really any changes. <laughs> um, just some wording changes. And it was interesting because the attorney changed some things that he had changed differently the last time he looked at this. But that's okay. They, they were not, um, not consequential changes. So they were language changes. Hey, Joyce got a question. Joy. Um, I noticed when I was looking through this, a cup, um, some errors. Where is it? Um, inner guest house has one space per room. I think you should say, be saying guest room there. Wait, where are you? 
In the housing or the parking numbers. Yeah, I think okay, you just parking. went by it, didn't you? Parking. Yep. Go back to parking. So, and which one are you looking at? In or guest house. It has one space per room. In or guest house. Okay. Next Can you go question. down, down to I? Okay. Go. Here we go. Yeah. In or guest house. Right. Um, I think you need that to say guest room, not yeah. each room in the building. Yeah. Or that's, bedroom or something. Yeah. yeah we had guest room, room under hotel. So that's why I yeah. said guest. guest. Room. Yeah. Good. That's let's add that in there. Her guest room. Great. And then and I don't know if you've seen the, I forget what article it was that we had, um, that was just talking about how we're kind of overdoing it with parking. And we have taken it down quite a bit, but one and a half spaces for um, single, two family and multi family per dwelling unit. I don't know whether or not we want to consider not doing as much there. Um, Uh, you're looking at dwelling per dwelling unit how did we come up with one and a half spaces per dwelling unit well it was and as far as i understand it it was mm -hmm. well it was revy's preferred way of doing this as averaging out the number of um well, the basic question was to reduce the parking a little bit, the parking requirement to allow for more housing. That was the basic strategy that we were working off. Right. And then he made this as a kind of an average between the um, studio apartments, the bedrooms. It's very problematic to count bedrooms as oh, we I found remember. <laughs> I the water and sewer people were trying to count bedrooms and everybody was rapidly converting their bedrooms into studies and playrooms right. and so well, the, bedrooms this is, isn't a huge sticking point for me Virginia I'm just bringing it up and then the, the other one was um yeah. well what do you think I mean do you think that works or I don't know. I mean, I think it should be one, one dwelling unit. So that means apartment, right? Doesn't matter how many bedrooms. Right. Or is that a bedroom? No, what per dwelling unit? So it's 1.5 for a studio, for a one bedroom, for a two bedroom in a multifamily with I a guess 1.5 isn't bad because then it's one person living there and a guest making sure that they, um, I don't know how you do it. I mean, when when somebody just has one dwelling unit, you have to have one and a half parking spaces. Yeah, what is what is, what is like, that? What do you do single that? family? What is, what is that? Yeah. So, so that's a, a Barbie car. Right? <laughs> and then the other one is fifteen spaces per thousand square feet of restaurant. That seems like a lot. I mean, how many square feet do you think um, that pizza place is by the park? Um, maybe, maybe a thousand square feet, three thousand square feet, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. The animal hospital is 2,500 square feet footprint. At least 15 spaces there. Oh. I mean, they're not all marked, but we'll say they should, right? Well, that's I, I'm gonna, I'll take a look at what it used to be and do a little research. I just noticed this before the meeting. So I, I just am, I didn't want to not say something because then I didn't want it to be a surprise if I brought it up next time. But um, these were just a few things I noticed and you could totally keep moving on. And um, So are you thinking that's a lot or a little? I think it's a, a lot because I feel like if it's the entire restaurant, including the kitchen, um, and storage and bathrooms, like how big is the actual? Because in, in other in other um, areas, we've said of like the retail space, and I kind of feel like maybe we want to do the dining room space. Um, hmm. But again, I felt like it was a, too much, but I, I'm going to do a little research and then come back next time. Okay. 
Yeah, that would be mm -hmm. great. Okay. Yep. No problem. Thank you. Uh, These are a minimum, not a maximum. Correct? This is a minimum, but she thinks it's too much well, for a minimum. It, so it seems like in many cases it's barely adequate, but people can ignore. Now, if it's too much, that's different. Um, let's see. What size do we think the uh, big spruce is? Is that 3,000 square feet? No, oh, the footprint um, of that restaurant? 2,000 square feet, 3,000? 40 by 50 back. I'm trying to think of the frontage. It's no more than 40 feet wide. 40 feet by like 80 feet, maybe. Yeah, but the dining room is tiny. Yeah, but they've got people all around that deck in the summer. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, luckily they don't have a parking <laughs> requirement. <laughs> I mean, luckily, if you want to look at it like that. Right. Adam, okay. yes. right. Adam oh. wants to make comments. Yes. Can you guys hear me? I know this is an issue last time I was on my computer. Oh, much better. Oh, great. I don't know what I did, but it worked. I was just going to um, just had a little point that maybe we could, you, well, not we, I said, I said we, I meant you guys um, could tie the parking requirement to the fire marshal's issued occupancy. And then it's, uh, you know, then it is directly proportional to the amount of patrons that may be in there at any given time and it avoids the square footage of the building as an arbitrary factor. Um, we did that in, in other areas too. So, I mean, that could be applicable here in Virginia. Okay. Just, I know, yeah, so that, that way it's directly proportional to the amount of people as opposed to, you know, if there's a huge kitchen and four tables, that's obviously a much different parker, different parking requirement than the opposite. Okay, we could look into that. <clears throat> okay, I'll put that on my list. All right, uh, as one, one more point, just uh, on the residential portion, is it possible to set, require, uh, I know in other towns when I was doing development work, they had um, required a certain number of parking spaces per lot with a certain amount of guest spaces per whatever. And, and the only benefit would be that it would specify, you know, it would avoid the, um, the half spaces issue and all that. Um, might be a little more clear for people trying to look at it. That's it. Okay. Maybe Robbie can answer these questions. Yeah, I mean, did we have that in Jolene Court? Some guest spaces. I think we had guest spaces allowed. But anyway, we could look into that. And also, what is a half a space? What does it look like? <laughs> do you round up or do you round down? That's an important thing to. With, yeah, this is a one. this is a question that has also been debated ed endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Do you round up okay. or do you round up? Thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. All right. So how do you all feel about going with this meeting until 9:30? Does anybody object? We don't have Chris Granda here to make a motion to adjourn. Um, Let's get it over with. But it would be nice if we could talk a little bit about these definitions that we have um, developed and just at least get them out there on the table so we could maybe. Right. There's going to be some carryover to the next meeting yeah. on the definitions. Okay. So, Virginia, I'm fine going a little bit longer, but I didn't make it to the, what is it, the one thing I. Didn't have time to look over again. Um, it's not even in here, is it? I've got the multi housing standards in there. Oh, there they are. And grocery revised. Oh, the definitions. I guess, yeah. I, I'm gonna put I it, I'll put it up on the screen. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. We can take a look at it this way. <clears throat> so, the attorney had no problem with us, A, res, you know, restricting types of development by size, as opposed to by ownership. We can't do ownership. We can do size. 
and we can do the way it appears. And we can have that language in the features that develops the character of the neighborhood somewhat that works. But so the goal with these definitions is first of all, to try to discourage the chain stores and secondly, to avoid a food desert, which was Chris Granda's big thing. And he's not here to defend it right now, but uh, we worked with that. So we made two categories of retail stores, a large scale over 5,000 feet and a village scale, which is under 5,000 square feet. In the gateway, retail of either kind is not allowed. So that is not an issue in the gateway. In the village, we have added as a conditional use village scale retail. So you could have a small store um, and we have cut out certain categories of things. For instance, a store that sells vehicle fuels, like a convenience store at a gas station is not covered by this retail use. Neither is automobile and marine sales, lumber. Any store that sells primarily medications is going to have to come under the definition of a pharmacy. And any store that sells primarily food is going to have to come under the definition of a grocery store. So to avoid the type of store that might be a variety store, we won't mention any names, but we know what we're talking about, but who sells food, we require that 25% of their floor area is sells fresh food. And the thinking here, mine and Revy's, when we worked on this was, if you have even the unmentionable variety store, Little Box, that has shrunk itself down to 5,000 square feet, and it sells some food, but 25% of its floor space is fresh food. What is wrong with that? Why would we want to prohibit that? That seems like a useful thing that people would want. The only problem it doesn't solve is, okay, you can't have it in the gateway. So the gateway is not going to take away from our downtown grocery store because it's not that type of store is not allowed in the gateway. If we allow this type of retail store in the village residential commercial, at least that is in the center of the village. You know, this area is the center of the, and we, don't really want to prevent any kind of retail store from being in the village. The only thing we want to prevent is for them to sell a lot of junk food and drive out the grocery store that sells fresh food. So if we, we require any retail store that sells any food, basically, to sell 25% of its floor space in fresh food, what is wrong with that? You know, is that a we problem? We actually have a living example of one that works, and that's and we like how it works well enough to kind of institute that, you know, into the future. Sure. Yeah. So that's the theory. There is basically what we're doing by these definitions that require any store that sells food, i.e., more than two percent of its floor space. We are essentially preventing stores from locating in these two districts that sell between 2% and 25% food. That's what this amounts to. If you sell food, you have to sell 25% fresh, or I think we should add fresh frozen food because that's really a perishable type of food. I agree. Mm -hmm. So anyway. That's the strategy. There are two types of the retail that are exactly the same, except one is over 5,000 square feet, one is under square 5,000 square feet. We're only preventing the village scale in the village. The grocery stores are also required to have 
of the gross floor area devoted to fresh or frozen produce, meats, and dairy products, so perishables. We know that our grocery store, which is not in this district, but this definition is going to apply because it's a definition, it is going to apply across the board. We know our grocery store has more than 25% of its gross floor area devoted to the sale of fresh or frozen food. With the pharmacy, we also wanted to prevent a big Walgreens that sells a lot of junk food. So with pharmacies, we are just not allowing them to have more than 2% of their floor space be devoted to food. So a big Walgreens is not gonna come here. However, the small Walgreens, the pilot project that we've been reading about the small format pharmacy of four or 5,000 square feet only has the medications and maybe a tiny bit of snacks and beverages. So they can come here if they want to be a small scale, village scale size and not sell food, basically. So the attorney was fine with this. It seems to me like it solves our problems. On the other hand, it does prevent a any kind of store from selling between two and 25% produce. So we have to think about what we, <laughs> if we really want to do that. And I've, you know, I've gone to a number of websites looking at stores like Trader Joe's. Well, that's not really their business model to sell fresh food. However, they're going more towards that direction because people want it or, you know, so, <laughs> we can think that we're pushing stores to sell more fresh food. We would probably have to take that approach, which according to the attorney is legal. You can prevent stores from locating here between two and 20. He says it doesn't give him heartburn, so that's okay. Um, but the question is, do we want it? I mean, what kind of stores might have between two and 25% fresh produce? like an ethnic grocery store, maybe wouldn't want to have a lot of fresh produce. I don't know. Maybe they do. Do we care? You know, what about a like a general store, old fashioned general store that doesn't want to have a lot of fresh produce? Fresh produce is kind of labor intensive and it's, um, it's a rabbit hole you can go down if you want to read the supermarket newsletter, you know, the supermarket um, business periodicals. So, so horrors, horrors, you might not be able to have the pickle barrel. And you know, on, the, on the front porch with the rocking chairs and on the hardware store. Uh, it, th th this, you seem to, to me, you seem like you've captured it. What, what what the issue is and and these seem like um, uh, reasonable restrictions and um, covered as well as we can. You know the, and yeah Jeff and also I think we're framing the argument before it's got to be defended. So at least there's something to attack, but it focuses the attack on what we've already written instead of, well, you should allow fresh produce. And, well, we want to sell you know, a little bit of fresh produce. What's wrong with that? Well, we've already addressed those sorts of things. I think we know what we're up to, but I think we've addressed the, the we, we framed whatever coming arguments there will be in our terms is something that we've wrestled with. And these boundaries are, they're usable and the lawyer says they're defensible. Okay, I think we can make them work. If not, it's going to be a big learning experience for us. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, I'm open to any comments on this. It's not. Mm -hmm. So I have, know, I have a comment. I have a comment, Virginia. 
seen it, but Chris. Um, if this is the uh, approach that folks want to take in the gateway I, to, to limit certain types of uses, I'm, I'm, and this is the way the Planning Commission wants to go, I, I would support that. I would support this approach over the formula business approach because I think this has less risk of getting something we don't want. Yeah, it's and okay, thank you. Um, in the gateway, what is proposed is that there's no retail of any kind. There is a village scale pharmacy would be allowed and a village scale grocery store. So those are up for discussion if people want to do something different there. In the village, it doesn't seem like it's reasonable to prohibit retail. So we have village scale retail, grocery store, and pharmacy. Yeah, that's all that's all fine. Okay. Um Adam. Oh, I just had a question. <clears throat> um one store that I have been frequenting uh, quite often is <clears throat> the job site is Jericho Center Country Store. And I was curious how that would all work. I know the majority of their food is not fresh that they sell, but they sell a prepared food and how that all works out. Because it seems like that type of store, you know, obviously I don't think that Jericho Center Country Store is going to move to Richmond, but a store like that that's locally owned and does that kind of thing would be great. So just kind of curious. Um, does it have a gas pump? Uh, it does. Is that yeah. the okay? That's so a good point. Maybe are, that's why they keep that the gas pump food. going. Right. So we purposely excluded so-called convenience stores that are associated with gas. And then just out of you know, obvious, um, uh, you're you're trying to you know create the what create the the most harm to uh, a formula business with the least harm to local businesses, but is there, is there any way with this zoning um, where they where a store like that? I mean, I imagine they make no money on their gas pump. They, that's just a holdover from when they had it. Um, is there any way a store like that without a gas pump could be permitted? Um, I mean, I guess I, I don't think it's very likely. And I think that it's not worth opening up the door to a, you know, one of the many chains we've discussed or you've discussed. Um, but just curious. So sorry yeah. to derail. Well, I mean, what we would be doing if we put this in place is would we, we would be saying to somebody who came with the idea of having a small variety retail store, like a country general store with no gas pumps, we would be saying, well, we're going to require that you sell fresh food. So I, my, I guess my question uh, more specifically was would the prepared food portion of that I know uh, was talking to um, talking about that and a huge huge percentage of their business dollar wise comes from the um, the prepared food the lunch and then on the dinners on weekends that they do it's like almost half their business so would would that count towards the fresh food or just how does that work or is that considered prepared food and that's a separate thing. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I personally would consider it to be perishable. If it's perishable, then it's fresh if it's refrigerated or frozen food. However, that might need to be clarified more if we want to make sure that the zoning administrator or the DRB does what we want them to do, then I think we would have to we need to clarify that. Like prepared meals to me it that seems like as counting the prepared meals as fresh food would accomplish the goal of you know there's very i i can't envision a world where a dollar store is willing to sell 25 percent uh prepared food in order to come to richmond so it seems like that would accomplish the goal but um the new yeah, ones that are obviously not up to me so thank you yeah if they were to sell 25 percent of prepared meals they're probably useful for residents of Richmond. You know, they're not contributing to the food desert that only 
snacks and chips and dog biscuits or whatever Cookies. contributes. So um, we wondered if something like Costco, which of course has no small format stores, uh, if they would qualify, but most people I talked to thought they had 25% fresh or frozen or prepared food. So, all right. Um, so people could think about this maybe a little bit for next time, but, and go over it, the details more closely. I don't know, are there any other comments about this approach? Chris, you sounded like you would support it, but maybe you would prefer something else? No, I, I, um, I, no, I support this approach. I think you were looking for feedback. Yeah, I was definitely looking for feedback. Um, yeah, I, I support this approach. You started off by saying, if we're going to prevent things in the gateway, this, I would support this approach as if maybe you were not totally on board with it, but anyway. I wasn't, I wasn't on board on the formula businesses, but now that we've had an appeal and lost and that approach isn't going to be used. I, I support the overall approach that this is taking. Okay, great. And you know, what we'll do is in each district. So when we come to thinking about the village commercial district where our 10,000 square foot grocery store is located, we will, mm -hmm permit grocery store large scale and yep. grocery store small scale village scale will have yep. you know they won't be allowed or or conditional uses um and since our grocery store is a very good grocery store and has at least 25 probably 35 or 50 yeah. percent um of these fresh perishable products then you know they'll count and as we come to each other district, then we'll look at it like the commercial and the IC district. Would we like to have the ability for a large scale retail business to go there, for instance? Well, we'll have to talk about it when we get to those districts. But this gives us the opportunity of fine tuning it a little bit. Mm -hmm. What? Okay, so yep. I uh, think... Um, Maybe that's all that we want to do tonight. I'm thinking that everybody is pretty much okay with voting on this next week when we figure out those few points that we have left. Um, is there any short more to cover? I mean, you have a little bit of... No, I think that's it. Um, so on the, you mean on the agenda? No, it's just if there's like just another page or two. Or no, that's it. That's all we had. I did motion, make mo oh. motion to adjourn, Madam Chair. Second. Okay. <laughs> so, any discussion? I guess you can't discuss that. But Do you need to make any comments before we vote on it. We're not going to vote. We're going to go. Oh, oh, before we vote on this. Yeah. Perfect. No, I don't really need to make any comments. The only comments are I'm really hoping that we can finish this next week. I mean, next time in two weeks and move on to the other things that are stacking up on our list. <laughs> so if you have any comments, please email them in by all means, and we'll work on these few points and try to get some resolution there and try to come ready to vote next time. So anyway, all in favor of adjourning should raise their hand or say aye. 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 I guess that's it, Allison. Yeah, yes, okay. I am to her. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you all for coming. Um, Sid, we didn't ask you if you had wanted to make any comments, but you should, uh, based on what you've heard, let me know if you have anything you want to say. You could just email. And Adam, any other thoughts? It's great. Thanks for hanging in there and participating. Um, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank <Yes>. you <laughs> welcome and we'll see you all next time it will be on the 1st of february yeah hmm. all right okay good night good night thank you all bye now